you piece of sh Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. The Phillies suck! The Phillies suck! It's that simple! This Phillies team is utter garbage! They are pathetic! They waste my time every single night. I feel the need to sit on my couch and watch them, and today, I felt necessary. I thought it was necessary to watch them do it twice. Shame on me, really. Who does it come down to? Does it come down to me actually thinking, well, this would be worth my time? Well, this would be worth my day? Three hours and then three hours after that of baseball of pathetic disgusting baseball how do I put myself through this constantly I should look in the mirror smack myself in the face and wake the hell up because it's my problem it's my problem but it's also their problem for putting me through this all right Matt Klintak you scum you're garbage you put Mickey Moniak out there in game one you give the lineup card to Joe Girardi and you want to make sure that your number one overall pick is in there, and then he sucks out in left field, drops a really easy ball to catch, it costs the Phillies runs, and he's bad. He's a bad first overall pick. He has no right to have on a Phillies uniform, and he shouldn't be in the major leagues at all, and he probably never will be in the major leagues at all. He is an embarrassment at the moment, and the fact that he's even playing in poor in minutes down the stretch is a big middle finger to you, Matt Klentak, because you should no longer be associated with this damn franchise ever again. And that's the that's the best thing about this. Imploding once again, multiple years in a row. Seeing Matt Klentak walk out the door should be a damn national holiday because he is one of the biggest jokes to ever walk through this sports town. He actually put together a game plan, looked at this bullpen and said, they will be good enough. They should be able to execute. Now, why is that? How is that? How do you make trades and go out and get other players and then somehow your bullpen is just as bad, if not even worse than what it was before. I can't get over it. I am so sick to my damn stomach that I sit on this couch and I go, I'm going to watch them. I'm going to put myself through this misery. When Workman took the mound in extra innings, I knew. Come on, everybody knows. There's no way anybody sits there and watches and goes, yeah, you know what? They're going to come up with this victory tonight because Workman's going to throw some electric curveballs that aren't going to get rocked. He's going to throw some great pitches that's not going to leave the damn yard. Shame on you. I want what you're smoking. I want what you're drinking. If that's the case, it's crazy to me. It really is. This team has important games laying right in front of them, and there's nothing. There's nothing to this team. Lifeless. And you know what? Maybe they scored some runs there in the second game and showed a little bit of fight. But a little bit of fight is not good enough for me at all. You need to win the games. Right now, the standings don't say, hey, they showed fight, so maybe they're going to get a better chance to make the playoffs. Screw that. That's nonsense. I don't care about fight this, fight that. Win the damn baseball games. In the first game, you score one run because of Gene Segura homer, and look, the guy who threw the entire game, all seven innings, his ERA was over seven going into the baseball game. Both. Garbage. That's what he is. He's garbage. And you can't score any runs. There was a chance for boom, bases loaded, couldn't execute. Guess what? It's September. You have to execute. Now, you want me to rip Aaron Nola? Because I will rip Aaron Nola. Was there poor defensive plays all over the place? Mickey Moniak, Jay Bruce on the first baseline, Bryce Harper out in right field. There was some infield single action happening. I don't care, though. Was Aaron Nola good? Nope, he was not good. You need Aaron Nola to be elite Aaron Nola in those moments. Look at his statistics. In September, his ERA is 4.21, and he's 7-11. and 11. I need Aaron Nola to step up in big moments. If he went the distance, if he went seven innings, and he threw 95 pitches, struck out nine, allowed one earned run, and the Phillies lost one nothing. I'll tip my cap and I'll give him credit. But that wasn't good, Aaron Nola. You need him to be dominant in these particular spots. I demand way more out of Aaron Nola. And I said when the Phillies had more of a chance to win the damn, or not win the damn playoffs, jeez, hell no, get into the playoffs, I thought, 
The only reason why I wanted wanted to make it was because of him. I wanted to see Aaron Nola in this high-pressure situation. Well, this is a high-pressure situation, too. Not the same as a playoff game, but very important to the franchise. And he did not step up and give you one of those holy hell 10 strikeouts. The Nationals have no chance. That's what you need out of him. So he wasn't good enough. That doesn't mean the offense was good. The offense was so awful. The defense was so awful. But Aaron Nola, from a mano e mano standpoint, pitcher versus the hitters, I need to see a better version of Aaron Nola. And I said the same thing about Zach Wheeler in the first game against the Nats when he went five and two-thirds and 113 pitches. It's not like he gave up a bunch of earned runs, but if we are going to think about postseason baseball, Nola and Wheeler are going to be a factor. If they could ever figure this damn thing out with this organization, if they could ever figure out the bullpen and some missing pieces, those two guys are going to be here and they are going to be pitching. So in those specific spots that I'm mentioning, they they are going to have to be better versions of themselves. So yes, I hold them to a higher standard down the stretch when you're talking about a team that's trying to sneak themselves into one of the most fraudulent playoff systems ever created for the sport of baseball. They don't deserve a sniff of postseason ball. By the way, this episode, we are broadcasting live from the Manscaped Man Cave. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BROD at manscaped.com. I'm sweating. Uh, I mean, I am so angry with this team. There are people blaming Joe Girardi. Why? For putting in Workman? Well, did you see who he used? It was a bullpen game, and that's another thing. Look, this team is trying to make the postseason, and you have arguably the worst bullpen ever assembled in the history of Major League Baseball, and down the important ride of the schedule, you need to throw a bullpen game in a double in a doubleheader. Excuse me. David Hale, okay. Adam Morgan, okay. Phelps, sucks. Jojo Romero, intrigued, but sucked today. You had a little juice out of Tommy Hunter, Hector Neris, a couple innings each, and then Workman. And you want to you wanna start screaming, hey, well, how about this guy, that guy, this guy, whoever's left in the bullpen, a Connor Brogdon. I mean, I'm just spitballing off the top of my head. Really? You want Connor Brogdon? In that scenario, stop. That's my point. Go look at the ERA of this team and all these players individually. There's no real option here. And that's the problem with this team and the way that it was assembled from the jump. Now, is there a problem with Bryce Harper? It seems that way. Post game, you heard some comments from JT Real Muto talking about Bryce Harper's back and... and it seems like there's probably a significant injury there that he's pushing through. Well, it looks that way. You know, I talk about holding Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler to a high standard. I do the same with Bryce Harper. He had those doubles, the home runs. It seemed like he was turning the page. And then just like that with the snap of his fingers, he turned back to the bad, poor version of himself that we got for a majority of the season this year. And it just doesn't make sense. It's not adding up. Bryce Harper's a streaky guy. He has been throughout his entire career. A lot of great emotional highs and a lot of poor, bad lows as well. That's who he is, right? But... Normally, when he gets hot and he goes on that stretch, it's way longer than the period of time he gave us, and you can see that something is off. You can see that there is something holding him back, and I'm just curious what information we are going to receive when the season is all over, because I guarantee he is trying to fight through something. Now, does he get a free pass because there's some sort of back injury there? Not really. I mean, he left a lot of guys on base, and when he's swinging the bat, whether he's in pain or not, whether he's taking something to help his pain or not, he does look to have some very powerful swings up at the dish. So, I mean, he's up there. If he's up there and he's playing through it, I expect him to go out there and get those big hits when those moments occur. And there were plenty of times with men on in scoring position that he had to come up with that hit, and he failed for the team. You want me to be excited that in the fifth inning, after Harper and JT Real Muto fail, Didi gets a hit to make it 6-5? The score was 6-3 to three at one point. Juan Soto, it's a monster bomb. Right, so it's 6-3. Should I be pumped that Didi Gregorius got a hit, knocked in a run? 
that JT Real Muto battled through an injury and he's running as hard as he can to beat out an infield single to tie the game 6-6. Six to six. Big hit for JT. Should I be all amped up about that? Look, I, I can see that JT Real Muto, think about it this way. He's going in a in a year where he's going to get paid. He's going to be a UFA. There's a lot of turmoil, it seems, between this front office and him and his agent because there's not a deal done. Is he going to hit the open market? Right? So there's a lot of speculation going on with JT Real Muto being a big-time player for a lot of teams this offseason. Yet here he is fighting through a significant injury, and he's running as hard as he can through first base, and it looked like there was a little wobble afterwards. I can see that he cares. The care level is there. But I can only take the care level so far. This team needs to win. And I know JT Real Muto can't be the guy that saves the game in extra innings. If Workman blows it, Workman blows it, regardless of what JT Real Muto does. And that's fair. But I look at this team as a whole, and nobody really gets a free pass. Does anyone get a free pass? When you're on a team that fails, I look at everybody involved. So, John Middleton, you seem to look like a fraud right now. Matt Klintak, get the hell out of my city. I never want to see your damn face again. Should we play what he said the other day about JT Real Muto again? I, I think I'm going to. For some reason, I feel like just pissing myself off even more. Why do I do this? It's almost like I enjoy my blood boiling. Because if I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't sit through this damn team and talk about them every single day. All right, perfect. I found the clip. Let's uh, let's play the clip. Hold on a second. A lot of moving parts here. Bang, bang. Here we go. I, I mean, look, I think with my, what I've said all along is, you know, we would, we would love to have JT here, but when you make that, when you make that trade, um, you know, you're trading for two years of control and you know that. So, um, you know, Sixto looked really good against us. He's looked good this year. Um, but you know, we've, we've had two very productive years of JT as well. You're a joke! You had two productive years? You had essentially 500 years where you plummeted in September. And hey, Matt Klentak, in case you didn't notice, you're doing it all over again. So your handful of seasons with JT Real Muto, you're doing it again. You're doing it again. So your you're two years of control you're all excited about, whoop de damn do you failed. And you specifically failed this team, failed this organization. Who's left up to call up? There's no excitement for any of these guys. There's no prospect that you can't wait to see, that you're ready to look forward to, that can change where this franchise is headed. You gave that away. You gave that away in Sixto Sanchez for this couple of little years of JT Romuto where somehow, some way you thought this team was ready to compete and thought that JT Real Mucho would be the difference in bringing this team a championship or not? Well, that is such a ridiculous thought process if that's truly how you felt about this roster over the last couple of years when you assess Major League Baseball. Do you look around the league? Do you see teams like the Dodgers and the Yankees? Even though they went through an ugly stretch, they had a ton of injuries. When you look at powerful, legit teams in this league, do you really associate the Philadelphia Phillies with those type of squads because if you do you have a serious problem and this team has a serious problem and this owner has a serious problem because all through the past couple of seasons you heard about how much of a genius this guy is how is this guy intelligent when it comes to putting together a roster that can compete when all we've seen is well realistically nothing and 500 baseball 500 baseball are you okay with that? Are you satisfied with that? This is what you get. This is what you get. And can you make the argument that this team with a competent bullpen can actually maybe make the playoffs in a real season? None of this fake COVID-19 crap that they put together for expanding the, the playoffs. If they fix the bullpen, could this team compete? Y yes, yes. But you know how many bullpen pieces you need? A brand new bullpen. Tell me how you're going to get that done when you can't actually get any good bullpen pieces out of your farm system, right? So it's not like you can call anybody up from double A or anything in the minor leagues because you don't have anyone that can actually produce for you. 
Okay, JoJo Romero's a little intriguing, but a lot of these guys are just a mess. So you can't spend big money in free agency to do it. You tried that with David Robertson. It failed. Although I'm not going to criticize that move because throughout his entire career, he was healthy and he was a factor for his clubs. So that's just a very unfortunate one. But all around, when you look at the payroll, my point is you look at how much money you need to spend on a Gene Segura. And I'm throwing Bryce Harper out of the mix because you spend that money. I support that move without a doubt. But Gene Segura, and you go around, you have to spend money to get players like that because, well, you can't really draft well and then you can't find guys that you can pull up out of your minor leagues to pitch in the bullpen. You don't have enough money to stay under the luxury tax, which is a problem that the ownership's not willing to go over the luxury tax because that's going to hold you back when you have a GM that can't comprehend any sort of money, right? He can't comprehend any sort of, um, you know, luxury tax and finances or any of that nature. He has no clue what he's doing. So you don't have the ability to just fix the bullpen if you want to stay under the luxury tax, which it's pretty damn obvious John Middleton wants to do that. It's so ridiculous that year after year after year, I'm watching the same mess, the same absolute trash can happen over and over and over again. And there needs to be change. I demand change, and I think you're going to get change because you Cannot satisfy this fan base bringing back the slop that you have up top, upstairs. All right, John Middleton, this episode is sponsored by Orbit Energy and Power. With over 20 years of experience in the industry, they are home to your solar experts in both residential and commercial projects. They offer flexible financing solutions such as $0 down. In addition, they will make sure you receive all the state and federal incentives when switching to solar. There is no risk and no need for investment. Make sure you check out their information. It is down below in the description. I also want to throw in, look, uh, the the other day I bet on the Blue Jays in the second game of a doubleheader because the Phillies won game one. It was a bullpen game. And, of course, that was the one game the Phillies actually won when it came to sweeping a doubleheader in the same day. Shame on me. I should have known better. But I use BetQL to help me make picks. And I went against BetQL, and I should never do that ever again. So from that point on, I've stayed steady with what the sharp money says on BetQL, and I've been hitting every night. Now, BetQL gives you analytics. It gives you all the smart money, which is all the professional bettors. It gives you a bunch of phenomenal trends. It is so worth it. And you get 20% off of your first payment using promo code BRODES20 at BetQL.com. Their information is in the description as well. Now, I'm telling you, if you want to start making cash and betting on teams in all sports, NFL, MLB, playoffs is obviously coming. You won't see the Philadelphia Phillies in there. I guarantee it. You won't see them. You want to check out BetQL. What the, what the smart money says, what the professional money says... I just follow that at this point. Shame on me for going the other way around. But that's how valuable the information is that BetQL can provide. (sighs) A walk-off dinger. As soon as I saw it leave the bat, I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. Although... You're not really surprised, right? It's such a weird mix of emotions because you know, you know it's happening. Nobody thought that they were going to win the game when Workman was on the mound. Not even Workman, and that's where the problem lies too. Brandon Workman enters the game. He runs out of the bullpen going, ah, damn it, here we go again. I'm not going to check Twitter when I'm done. I'm going to stay off my phone tonight. I might not even be able to sleep in the bed because my wife might kick me out and force me to sleep on the couch because I suck so much. That's definitely a possibility. I'd be shocked if his wife actually cooked him dinner. He doesn't deserve it. That's what Michael Jordan would do, right? Michael Jordan wouldn't allow him to eat if he was his teammate. Well, maybe that's what he needs if that's going to change his focus level. And it's wild, though, because if you look at his stats last year, if he hit free agency last year, After last year, that is, he would have got some cash. And that's the scary thing about relief pitchers. They're so inconsistent. It's year after year. It's so wild. I just want to touch on that Mickey Moniak thing one more time. Today on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN, Mike Gill and I, we're on from 2 to 6 p.m. You can download the free mobile app and listen to us. It's uh, it's a phenomenal show. But we saw the lineup when we were on the air in game one, and we were freaking out because we saw Mickey Moniak's name. 
And Gil wanted to rip Joe Girardi and said he puts blame on Joe Girardi for having him in there. And I said, Gil, the managers don't make the lineup cards anymore. It's all analytical-based. And I'm sure Matt Klentak wanted to prove a point with Mickey Moniak. That was his guy, and he wanted to put him out there. And Gil fought back and said, look, you're you're a manager of a team trying to win games. He was supposed to have somebody that had more of a voice than Gabe Kapler. He was supposed to come in here and maybe stress more of his own personality on things. He should go into that office and say, shove it. Shove it up. And while I understand what he's saying, in theory, Joe Girardi should have the power to overrule Matt Klentak or any other numbers and go, I don't want Mickey Moniak out there. He's not ready. We could go down a different road. Maybe find a way to get Andrew Knapp in there. I'm just spitballing. Look, it's better than Mickey Moniak. Scott Kingery, is he better defensively even though he's not good at all from the plate? Even though he did have a home run in the second game and all around over the last handful of games, he was better than the the floor, which was just terrible. I mean, he was at the floor all season long, so anything was better than what he provided. So over the last handful of games, he was a better version of himself, but I didn't really care about the offensive side because I can't really trust him to be a great player this year in this moment, but fine. Better defensively than Mickey Moniak? Sure, I can get behind that. Regardless, the moral of the story here is Gill was trying to say that Joe Girardi should have the power to do that. And I think he should have the power to, but this is how it works in 2020. They're handed the card. They are handed the card. They don't have a lot of say. They don't. And this is every manager around baseball. I know it's not fun. I know it's not the way it should be. I like the old school way of things. There's no denying that baseball is trending in the wrong direction. But I'm also here to say whether you like it or not, This is what it is. So I don't blame Joe Girardi for having Mickey Moniak in the lineup at all. Some might look at it and go, he should look at that front office, flip them the bird, and said, this isn't the best product that we can put out there in this specific moment. And on this day, we have to win. I like that fire. I like that intensity. I would like to see that actually go down. But I know that that is a a big, far-fetched idea. All right, it's it's a it's a dream. It's not a reality. Could you imagine Philadelphia sports fans wake up the next day after Joe Girardi pulled that off and the Phillies win? Right? It would be this awesome story. But that's not who Joe Girardi is, and it's not what the manager position is like anymore. So here we are. We're going down the rest of the schedule just like we have over the last handful of seasons, plummeting and plummeting fast. And they lose in heartbreak fashion once again. A moonshot, walk-off, two-run bomb when the Phillies had the lead. The Phillies had the lead because of a Roman Quinn bunt. He can't hit it all, so he tries to bunt it. He beats it out with speed. His speed did force pressure on the defense that scored a run. Keep in mind, you had the rule of starting a runner on second base at the time. So you kind of realized, or thought at least, with this bullpen, that a run would be scored to tie it up anyway. And the Phillies did have a chance. They did have a chance when it was 7-6 in the top. Top of the inning. 7-6 at the top of the inning. They could have put on more runs and gave the bullpen more run support. They need as many runs as they could possibly get. Right? They should have been able to score more runs. Who was it in that in that last inning? JT Real Muto, Didi Gregorius. Guys that I expect to be able to get the big hit when they need to get the big hit. Now, is that the real reason why they lost? If you really wanted to dive it down? No. I mean, it's the, the fact that the bullpen was probably the worst bullpen ever assembled. That's why it ended the way that it ended. But I'm just saying, I know they scored seven runs, and that's what you look at. And from afar, you go, okay, well, guess what? They scored seven. That should win you a game. And and that's not a wrong philosophy. But let's not act like there weren't plenty of other moments to tack on more runs and win this game. Because there were. Bases loaded opportunities. I mean, come on now. I would never, ever, ever be able to sit through 162 of this crap. 
So I'm stoked that this was a 60-game season because I would probably be bored from ripping out all my hair. I don't even know if I'd be alive. This team could have potentially been the death of Broads. That's unfortunate to think about. But the positive thing is, there will be change. There is no way in hell that there's no change. It's just physically impossible to own a sports franchise. Look at what your general manager has done over the handful of seasons. Look at the minor league system and go, we're going to bring you back. After hearing his comments about JT, and I put a ton of blame on the owner for JT. If he wanted JT, JT would be here. It's that simple. Now, we were talking to Kevin Cooney on 97.3 ESPN, and he brought up the fact that there's no way, he believes that there's no way John Middleton would allow JT Real Mocho to leave because that would crush things with Bryce Harper. It's obvious Bryce Harper loves JT. He wants him here. You signed JT for the contract that you did because you thought it was time to go start winning. He went for a longer term deal, less AAV to go spend money in other ways to help this franchise and to help this roster be able to compete At a higher level, it would be a really hard sell to Bryce Harper if you let him walk out the door after you gave up Sixto Sanchez. And I bought into that. I bought into that a little bit. And then I heard Matt Klintak speak. And when I hear Matt Klintak speak, I think to myself, well, John Middleton obviously feels the same way or else Matt Klintak wouldn't have said those words or John Middleton would come out and and say something afterwards. I truly believe that. So uh, it's obvious that the owner has the same mindset as whatever Matt Klintak stated to us, that that puke, that vomit that came out of his mouth at that pressure, that's the way the whole organization is thinking. At least the top guys that make the decisions, that's how they're thinking. And that's a problem. That's a problem for a long run, too, because John Middleton's not going anywhere. He can't get fired. I like him and I hate him at the same time. And right now, I I hate him more than like him. Because I'm not sensing he's making very smart decisions. And we need smart decisions to be made. Thank you all so much for listening. And I will see you next time.